Good morning, Community Chapel Peston. How are you guys this morning? All right, all right. That wasn't as enthusiastic as I was hoping for, but that's okay. That's okay. Hey, guys, I just wanted to, uh, before we open up the service this morning, I just wanted to uh, make a quick announcement um, from the elder board. Um, so, again, we just want to take this opportunity to thank you for your cooperation and patience as we've navigated these COVID pandemic waters here over the last year. Uh, we know that, you know, there are differences of opinions in regards to the situation, but so far, you know, the efforts to prevent an outbreak here at the chapel have been successful. So again, just thank you so much for the care that you show one another. Um, and although our vaccination rates remain reg relatively low here in Huntington County, we will be following the CDC guidelines as long as there are no serious outbreaks here in our area. Um, and as of now, um, they have changed it to fully vaccinated people are no longer required to wear masks, but those who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated are still required masks indoors. And we are just trusting in God's sovereignty with this, and we are trusting you that your continued efforts will pr protect one another. And we just thank you again. Each one of you are important to us, and we don't want to lose any of you. So thank you again, and I'm going to turn it over to Seth. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is super exciting to be here with you and for these for some of these announcements that we do have. Um, for those of you that enjoy serving for Vacation Bible School, well, that is scheduled for June 13th through June 17th, and there is a sign-up sheet in, in the back, in the lobby area, and we would love for you to come. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Many of you have done that for many years, and we're excited to be back doing that again. So um, we need a lot of people. Uh, I know uh, as far as being a camp director, kids are I mean, we have more kids signed up than we've ever had before, so I would think it's going to be the same for Vacation Bible School. So if you have any desire to serve, we would love for you to serve, to do that, sign up in the lobby, and then connect with Pastor Doug as well. That would be great. And that will be, um, that sign-up sheet will be, will be done on May 30th. Um, on the morning of May 22nd, there is an opportunity if you would like to come to Camp Kanesataki and do a Camp K trail run. It's the first one we've ever done, but uh, be an opportunity for you to come see the camp maybe, and take a run around the grounds. It's a fundraising event, but something fun, rain or shine, that we'll be doing. Also, that afternoon of May 22nd, the youth group will be having a photo scavenger hunt starting at 3 o'clock. Um, any youth group member planning on attending needs to contact Pastor Doug. Um, and one, or one of the youth leaders, um, and, and let them know the e this evening if you're planning on attending. Last thing would be the children's church. We need uh, a children's church teacher uh, for our first, first through fourth grade children's church class for the month of June. So that's coming right up, and uh, I will say, I did the month, I think me and my wife did the month of March. We had a great time. And so if you would be willing to do that, you will have a great time. It will be a blessing to you, and it will be a blessing to our kids here at the church. So if you wouldn't mind contacting Pastor Doug and, uh, and signing up for that, and again, if even doing it with your spouse is a great opportunity. So let's go ahead. Let's start the service with a word of prayer, and then we will sing and worship together. Lord, we come to you, and we just thank you for all the people that are here this morning, Lord, and those that are watching um, online. We, Lord, we, we just are so thankful that we're able to do this. We're so thankful for how you're progressing and how you're in control of all things, Lord. You are in control of um, the governments. You're in control of the economy, Lord. Nothing of, is taking you by surprise, and we are so thankful for that. And we, we do. We just want to submit our hearts to you this morning, Lord, that we would be in a place where we could hear from you. Lord, I pray for anybody that's anxious, Lord, that, you would, that your spirit would give them peace. And uh, Lord, that, that this morning would be a great opportunity to grow closer to you. Your word says that if we, if we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us, Lord. And we want that this morning. So we pray that everything we do and say this morning would bring honor and glory to you. And uh, that souls would be encouraged and your saints would be edified. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Daniel 9, 18 and 19 says this. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. This is the word of the Lord. This is Daniel's prayer of confession for the nation of Israel. He knew why they were sent into, into, um, into exile. It was because of their sins. And, and he prays to the Lord um, that the Lord would forgive them um, for his own sake, for the sake of his own glory. Um, so as we sing this first song, um, let it not just be a song, but let it be a confession um, of our need for Christ and his saving work on our behalf. stand and sing together. We are not what we should be. We haven't sought what we should see. We sing your glory, Lord, but looked away. Our hearts are bent, our eyes are dim. Finest works are stained with sin, and emptiness has shadowed all our ways. Jesus Christ, shine into our night, drive our dark a fountain. And 
sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. A dying thief rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. Till all the rest of church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till all the rest of church of God be saved to sin. Our scripture reading this morning will be Colossians chapter 1. You can turn, or Colossians chapter 3, if you want to turn your Bibles or you can look on our screen, we'll, we'll do that together. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word and how it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord, I pray that that would be where our heart is this morning. Lord, if there's anything that we are seeking above you or setting our affection on that is above you and that we are giving the priority, that we're giving um, the time, Father, I pray 
that, we, that you would show that to us, that you would convict our spirit, Lord, through your word. And Lord, we're thankful that your word is a two-edged sword and it cuts to our bone and to our marrow. And Lord, I pray that it would do that this morning, that it would convict our hearts, Lord, and that would, it would confirm in us when we're doing right. And Lord, I pray that we would have much reason to rejoice today because of Jesus. And it's his, in his name we pray. Amen. Of Christ's resurrection in our lives, hid with him. We have hope in a life after this. We have hope in a higher throne if we are in Christ. So let us sing together. There is a higher throne. before the throne of grace this morning. We are so grateful for the opportunity that we have as, as your created order 
to bring honor and glory and praise to your great name. Lord, as we consider the song of, of the heavenly host singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Constantly and, and, and for all of eternity, the holy heavenly host will declare your majesty, your supremacy, your glory, and your holiness before all the world. And Lord, we look forward as, as much as we have an opportunity to do that now in our fallen state. One day, these voices will join the heavenly host in bringing honor and glory and praise perfectly to your great name. And we long for that day to come. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for the strength that you give through the power of your Holy Spirit, your, not just your redeeming love, but your abiding love that continues to transform us as your people, that we might look more and more like our Savior Jesus Christ. And, and I thank you that you've given us your spirit and you've given us your word. And we have an opportunity in just a moment to look not only to the life-giving, but the life-changing word of God that continues to set us free, not only for eternity, but temporally in the here and now from the things that hold us back from running that race with endurance that you've called us to run. And I thank you, Lord, that as much as your word encourages us, as, as, the, as was shared in the prayer earlier, it also convicts us. And it's a good thing. In fact, when there is conviction in our hearts and lives, it is, it is a, great, a great indicator for us for the, the life of Christ in us. And you are calling us to that life. And so, Lord, I pray today, work in us move in our hearts. Lord, we are so, so easily lulled into complacency. And I thank you that as those songs were selected this morning, as the scriptures were shared, you have gloriously brought us to a realization, and I hope our eyes have been opened, our hearts have been opened to an understanding of your goodness, your holiness, your righteousness, and your love. Father, challenge us today. Encourage us and use us as your people. We ask it in the name of our Lord, soon coming King, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated, children. You may be dismissed, the children's church. Um, at this time, you may open up your scriptures to Proverbs chapter 5. As we turn to the word of God together this morning. And as we continue through the service, just to echo what Dr. Jamie shared in, and Seth as well. It's an exciting, a s exciting time for us. We're looking forward to continually moving forward towards getting back, if we want to call it BC or pre-COVID, the, the, the worship service format that we have enjoyed. But you know, there's something that, that's not been lost. No pandemic can take it away. No matter, no, no matter personal frustration can minimize it. And it's the power of the truth of the word of God. And God's word will continually sound forth and I pray it will continually penetrate our ears and our hearts and our lives as God's people. And today would be no different regardless of how exciting any other news because the most exciting thing that we can do together today as a household of faith as we bring honor and glory to God is to dig into his word and dig into the word this morning, we will. And so if you're not in Proverbs chapter five, I invite you to get there. But as we continue in our series, Walking Wisely in a Broken World, the last couple of weeks as Solomon has challenged his son, we've looked at the, the institution of marriage and, and the topic. It's something that, that, frankly, it's lost not only in the church, but, but you know, in a culture that's so deviantly sexually oriented. It's the idea of like sexual integrity, doing things God's way. And, and, and frankly, we, we don't hear it talked about. But that won't be the case because it's not like we're forcing this into the issue, this is something that is Solomon has challenged his son to walk in a wise and godly way. He just hits it head on, and he calls it what it is. And so today we're going to continue, and, and you're going to notice this sermon is titled Focus on Your First Love. And this is part one of two, because when I think of focus on your first love, personally, I think of Revelation chapter two, going back to our first love, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But we're also going to look at today, because it's the next thing in line with what Solomon's challenged his son. On the temporal note, looking at the first love in, the, in reference to our human relationships with our spouse. And that's an important relationship for us within the body of Christ, within our homes, 
to address. And you're like, well, maybe I don't have a spouse. So this message is for you too, as you're in the in-between stage there. But as we start here this morning, Laura Jean Allen, um, there's an illustration that James Dobson in his, his devotional for couples titled Nightlights, the very first thing that you'll read is this illustration by Laura Jean Allen. And, and Alan tells the story of how her grandparents, up until her grand's passing due to cancer, had been married for over 50 years. And throughout the 50 years of their marriage, they had this little game that they would play. And, and that little game was taking turns, hiding the word smiley, S-H-M-I-L-Y. And you're like, that's not how you smell smiley. No, not at all. Uh, it, and, and they would take turns taking smiley, and hiding it for each other to find. It might have gotten traced in the, in the top of the sugar canister or in the flour canister, so whoever the next one was to, to bake or to cook would, would find it. It might be written in the steam on the bathroom mirror so that when the, whether it was the husband or the wife would, would get their shower next, they'd find the word smiley written across the top of the mirror. Or as the grandfather found out, it might be written on the very last sheet of toilet paper. And that meant grandma unrolled the entire roll of toilet paper, wrote it on the last sheet, and perfectly rolled it back up just so her husband would be excited to find it when they reached the last sheet. And, um, you know, smiley is not a word. It's an acrostic. And it's so much more than just an acrostic for see how much I love you. That's what S-H-M-I-L-Y, see how much. I love you. And, and as they wrote that word, hiding it for each other to find, it was a personal reminder, as often as they found it, of the depth of their love for each other. And it was a love that was fleshed out as their granddaughter watched. They had no idea what that meant. They didn't know until their grandmother passed, and it was written on the ribbons, uh, on the flowers for the casket, what it meant on the spray. And, uh, but what she did know is fleshed out, it was, it was holding hands every chance that they got no matter where they were. It was stealing little kisses from each other, no matter how frequently they bumped into each other in their tiny little kitchen. It was becoming so close that literally they could finish each other's sentences. And as Alan pointed out, uh, when she saw it the most was how frequently they would bow their heads in prayer together, especially at mealtime, thanking God for all the blessings in their lives, especially each other. especially each other. You know, this illustration, and actually I have to read it several times uh, before I share it, because every time I read it, it gets to me. It reminds me genuinely of the abundant joy, of the abundant joy that there is to be had in the marriage relationship lived out God's way. And, and you know what, I, I share this with every couple I do premarital counseling with, the hardest human relationship you will ever enter into is the marital relationship. Amen? You do not elbow your spouse for saying that. It is appropriate. It is the most difficult relationship you will ever enter into is two self-centered, sinful, deviant sinners apart from Christ. Then you're just those things that are saved by Christ, living under one roof, wanting things our way, doing things our way, and trying to bring that together for the honor and glory of God. It's not always going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to be hard and extremely sacrificial and costly. But there is, there is joy to be experienced for those who will focus on doing it God, by God's will and by God's word. But it also gets me because it reminds me of those who haven't experienced this. And it breaks my heart as I hurt for them that while everyone that enters into marriage, I've never heard anyone say, I really hope this goes this way. I've never heard that. Not in 13 years of pastoral ministry, ever. What you hear is the, the joy, the anticipation, uh, the expectation of someone being there to meet their needs, to be sensitive, kind, caring, even Christ-like for those Christian couples. But you know what? That's not what they experienced. Or maybe today it's not what you're experiencing. But as we shared last week, the week before, many times throughout this ministry, today is another one of those pause moments. It really is. It's a pause moment. 
You have an opportunity. You know, we say this. It's a trite saying. It's never too late to do the right thing. You're like, yeah, right. You don't know. No, if when I say you, I don't understand or it's too far gone. No, what I'm saying is I don't doubt that God can do what he really says he'll do and that God is who he really says he is. Do you believe that God is who he says he is today, church? Yeah, that was, that's okay that it was weak because that's kind of where we're at in our humanity. We're like, yeah, we believe he can create all that we see around us, but my personal life's too hard. He doesn't get it. And I want to assure you, he more than gets it. He died for it. And he's provided the same resurrection power that rose his son from the grave to empower us to live this life out. And so this is a pause moment right here, right now, where we can look to God's word through the power of the spirit to set us on a path of relational restoration. And so what that means is maybe that isn't what you experienced before, but by God's grace, anything you enter into can be for his honor, his glory, and praise. And you can experience that. Maybe you're in the house of the Lord today, and you're sitting next to your bride, or maybe your bride's not even here with you, or your, your husband's not even here with you. Today is a day, the first day of the rest of your marital life, to do it God's way according to his word, as imperfect as you may be, that you might gloriously make him known to this fallen, deviant world around us. Amen? Today could be that day. It's not too late. It's not too far. Not when God is at the center. And I genuinely believe that. Not because I say it, but because God's word proves it. And so as we look to Proverbs chapter 5, having challenged his son repeatedly to consider the path that his feet were treading upon and the trajectory of his life. Listen, we don't like to do that because sometimes we're a little concerned with where we may be heading and not so much concerned, but we might even like in the flesh where we're heading right now. But Solomon's like, son, my son. How many times have we seen in five chapters, my son, my son. He challenges him to consider where are your feet taking you. And then we saw last week cautioning him to avoid the seduction that would sideline him from living a life that was wise and pleasing to God. And now, by God's grace, he calls him. Avoid the immoral woman. Ladies, avoid the immoral man. And pour into your own spouse. And again, if you're not married, you'll see today this message applies to you also. As we look at Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1, we said that we were to focus on our first love twofold here. And so that requires us to live in a right way with God. And then living in a right way with God allows us to live in a right way with the people around us. And that includes our spouses. And so in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, this is what we started out with. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. That is the way we behave towards the other fallen man around us. To give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. And a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. And, and, and why is he looking for that? To understand a proverb and a figure, to the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And then it goes on to say that fools despise wisdom and instruction. And as we've talked about this throughout the course of this, this Proverbs series, you know, we, we, we said that you know, Solomon wants his son to walk in a wise way. And, he, and he, he refers to wisdom as like lady wisdom. But we know that while that may be a feminine noun in the Hebrew grammar, this is looking forward to the embodiment of wisdom, Jesus Christ himself. And so our pursuit of wisdom is really a pursuit of Christ. And if you're pursuing Christ, it's Christ's likeness then in your life individually as a believer. And as we, can, as we consider the, the pursuit of Christ's likeness, then it challenges us in reference to our relationship with him. In a right relationship with him, we're more apt to be in a right relationship with each other. That makes perfect sense. If we're not in right relationship with each other, maybe we want to check where we're at with Christ at the moment. But on the flip side, where you're at relationally now will impact your walk with Christ also. And so it gives us a, a, a moment to just pause and to look at those 
areas. And, and so what, what do we want to do? Well, as, as Solomon goes to the word here this morning, as we go to the word with Solomon this morning, we want to learn to focus more and more on our first love, Christ, so that we can focus more and more on our first love temporally, our spouse, if we're married today, or our future spouse, if that's in your forecast. And so as we go to the word, we're going to look at it in the order Solomon gives it. And so when we learn to focus more and more on our first love, we're going to do so when we look, number one, horizontally. Horizontally. You know, Christ has the pre preeminence. We're going to look at that next week. But we're going to follow the scriptures here. And, and horizontally, we want to learn to be satisfied in our spouse. To be satisfied in our spouse. And as, you, as we look to the word here this morning, Solomon's antidote. He's challenged his son mightily in this area. His antidote to sexual sin, to live in a wise and godly way, and, and so to obey the Lord, is to be active exclusively with his own wife. Listen, this is one of those moments where I, I want to say I know this is a difficult area in our lives. But for some of us, this may be a real struggle right now. And, and, and you know what? As we share, God is holy, he's righteous, and just. His word says what it says, and that's what he's called us to as his people. God is also gracious, merciful, and kind. And it's not too late to look to him, to trust him, and in his strength, walk in his ways. And, and as we look to the scriptures, I pray, if that's us this morning, that we would, in whatever form that we may be struggling today. And you know what? We look at this, you're like, well, that's what Solomon's saying. But that's not Solomon's plan. That's God's plan. This is God's plan this morning for us. And, and I know the world is living 180 degrees differently than us. Amen? I mean 180. That is deliberate, folks. Satan is a mastermind. Listen, his plan worked in the garden from the beginning, and it still works today. And he's still, he's still tempting us with, the, with the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. It hasn't changed. It's been effective. It's still effective. Until we reach glory shore, it will continue to be effective in fallen man. But God has a plan. And in Proverbs 5, 3, you know, we have God's plan. But listen, this is Satan's counterfeit. And so Solomon's saying, like, listen, son, I, I want you to, like, to build this, this. I want you to have a plan, and I want you to have it buoyed around with, with thorns and with briars. And I want you to, to make sure that wisdom and discretion are on your lips. But he says in verse 3, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. It tastes good. It looks good. But as you're going to see as we, as we continue through the word, it is absolutely devastating. And I realize the world, maybe they don't grab a hold of this. But for us, it's devastating in our walk with Christ, in our walk before this world. But that's the counterfeit that Satan will offer up to counter what God has intended for us. I want to take us this morning to a book that as a pastor, I don't preach from through very frequently. And uh, some of these passages I have to read as well so that I don't blush before you. But Song of Solomon is a powerful love story with intensely graphic language. And as we read here in Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, listen to what, what Solomon offers up about his bride, the Shulamite woman, and what God's plan is for, for our marital relationships. He says, you have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. And as we read this, I, I want you to pay attention to the beautiful, powerful, and passionate imagery that, that Solomon uses uh, to speak of this intensely intimate and then the word permanent comes to mind, the nature of their love and relationship. I want you to notice the words um, because sometimes we fail to see this in reference to our wives and our husbands. But listen to the descriptors he gives to describe her, how precious and special that she is to him. And, and, and then I, I just, just listen to what the Word of God says. You made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes. You know, sometimes we won't even look at our spouses or even give them the time of day. And we use our attention and we wield it like a weapon. And I love what, the, what Solomon says here. He's like, no, nah, no, nah. with one glance of your eyes, I am smitten. 
He goes here, with a single strand of your necklace, how beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. And I just want you to understand, that is not his biological sister. You're like, why does he keep calling her my sister? We don't do like that here in central Pennsylvania. I don't think we do. In, in this context, in their culture, that very much spoke of the permanence and the depth it's a term of endearment for his wife. It's, it speaks of this undying and permanent love that he has. You know, you, can, you, you always say you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family, right? You might say, I disown you as my sister. I disown you as my brother. But biologically, they will always be your sister and brother. It's permanent. And that's what Solomon's saying about his wife, my sister and my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils and all kinds of spices? Your lips, my bride. Listen, Satan wants to give you a counterfeit and he wants you to think, hey, go after whatever it is that makes you feel good. But that is not what God's word says. Solomon says, your lips, my bride, drip honey. Does that sound familiar? Honey and milk are under your tongue and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. You know, that which his bride would provide for him in their marital relationship, it's sweet. It's sustaining, and it's special. And now, within the bonds of marriage, it's to be enjoyed. As we go back to Proverbs in, in chapter 4, I said God has a plan. And that plan looks a little like this. As Solomon continues on in Song of Solomon 4 and verse 12, listen to how he describes it. He says, a garden locked is my sister, my bride. Like, there's the beauty of this garden, but the gate's locked. You know, I, I, I can kind of see from outside in, but I can't get in there. A rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. He's like the fountain of this intimate, sensual, physical love is, is closed right now. And, and right now, you know, she is closed to his physical advances. But in verse 15, now we see a shift. You are a garden spring, a well of fresh water and streams flowing from Lebanon. Now that spring, that garden has been unlocked now that they're married. You know, as we, as we consider here this morning, this is another reminder that despite what the world will espouse, despite what even some of your quote-unquote Christian friends will espouse, God has a perfect and beautiful plan for marriage. He really does. I can't say I've had one couple say that I don't want a great marriage. I've never heard someone say, you know, I get married, I really hope this is deplorable and awful. I hope they spite me, won't speak to me. No one has ever said that, ever. Yeah, actually, you've got to kind of talk them down from having rose-colored glasses, thinking everything will always be easy. Sometimes they're like, why do you tell us this stuff? Because, listen, if you're not ready, ready or not, here it comes. It will come. The honeymoon will end. Sometimes it's sooner than later. We need to be ready. But God has a perfect and beautiful plan for marriage, for, for sexual intimacy, and, and, and its expression within the bounds of that relationship. And, and, you know, the truth is, it can be looked forward to. It is exciting. It is good. It's not nasty, dirty. It's not what, whatever words you, you want, you know, taboo. It, it is a beautiful thing within the, the marriage of a man and a woman. And God intended it that way. We can anticipate it. But it's to be waited for, honored, and cherished. And you know what? By God's grace here this morning and his divine enablement, my prayer is that corporately together that we might commit to honoring God in this way. And I promise you it's worth it. I promise you it's worth it. What if that's not, what if that's not the case this morning? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and starting in verse 18. You know, as we reread this text, Paul, Paul challenges the Corinthian church. And, and they are struggling. They're in the midst of some of struggle with, with sexual sin. And his counsel to them, as you're going to see, was to flee from it. Get away. It should sound very much reminiscent to what Solomon said to his son. And I mean, it's not on your screen. Stick with me. But in, first, or in Proverbs chapter 5, he says in verse 8, remove your way far from her. Come not nigh to the door. He's like, listen, don't even go there. 
Just get away. If that's where you're at right now, get away from that temptation. And so Paul is warning the Corinthians. Solomon is reminding his son, and God is calling us today to heed the same caution and warning. And so in verse 18, it says, flee immorality. Get away from it. Well, that's being a coward. No, it's being wise. And you're going to see in just a moment. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. And, and here, just a reminder, you know, how many times, and, and I can tell you, it's, it's came out of my own lips, and I've said this to my own mom. Hey, this is my body. This is my life. I'll do what I... Oh, yeah, you're good at that. Me too. It's my body. It's my life. I'll do what I want or what I please. And thankfully, there was discipline that usually followed that rebellious remark to my, my mom when I was a teenager. And uh, you know what, the, what my mom was gracious to do is take me to the Word. And I told you that last week, you know, Mother's Day. Maybe that was a strange Mother's Day message. Not if you lived in the Decker house. Not at all. And I'm so grateful my mom was willing to tackle the hard things in life, those hard discussions, and make sure I understood that God did have a plan, and there is a way that pleases him, and there's a way that displeases him. And I needed to hear that, because testosterone and hormone-driven, I was headed the opposite direction. And what she reminded me is what Paul told the Corinthians, or do you not know? Maybe you don't know this today. So, so give ear, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God, and that you're not your own? When you think of the temple, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And when you, as we've been reading through the Old Testament, do you remember the, the depths that they had to go to make sure anyone could ever go into the Holy of Holies? You couldn't. It was once a year, and that guy had to get splattered in blood. He had to be purified. He had to offer sacrifices to make sure he didn't die once he got there. That is how holy and righteous and good and pure our God is. Now, thank goodness, because we could never have entered on our own, Jesus Christ entered for us on our behalf. But Paul still says that your body is the temple, the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God, you're not your own. For you have been bought with a price, and, and that price was the blood of heaven's lamb. And so what does Paul say? Therefore, glorify God in your marriage and and that that in your marriage but in every area of your life in first corinthians 7 as we continue here this morning knowing that we've been called to honor god is he's given us this gift and i'm going to go to verse 7 it's on verse 9 you just stick right there with me Paul says something staggering, and as a man, I, I was never really one to think I'd ever follow his path here in this regard. He says, yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. That is single. Some of us, we may have thought we were never going to find anyone, and maybe that, that's, that's been a struggle, but, but there was never a doubt in my mind I wanted to find someone, and the gift that Paul exercised, Scott Decker did not have. He says, however, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it's good for them, even if they remain even as I am. Paul said, listen, there is nothing wrong if you're single now to be single. If God has given you that gift. You know, some of us were able to do that. And I remember one young lady at Lancaster Bible College, she assured us that, you know what, at this time, I have no intentions of getting married because right now I can serve God undivided in my attention, unhindered in, in any way. She didn't have a, anything against marriage. At that moment, she knew she needed to serve God with a single focus. Paul says it's a good thing if you can do that. But he says this in verse 9. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And so Paul is saying it's not a bad thing to be married because there is a, an appropriate place to exercise those passions and those desires. In fact, in Proverbs 6, 27, Solomon said this, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? I just want to tell you, before your clothes get burned, you will probably burn your hands. Has anybody ever tried to pick up a coal? Have you ever had it shoot up your shorts when you're sitting at a campfire? Do you know how painfully that burns? And I assure you, when you grab it with your hand, it burns your clothes, too. Puts a hole right through them. And, and so that's a, the answer is a resounding no. We, we can't play with fire and not get burnt. And so what are we called to do? 
what are we called to do? It's, it's called that institution of marriage, that gift that God has given. And, and so Paul writes this to the Corinthians in ver- chapter 7, verse 1. Now, concerning the things about which you wrote. I mean, they had written a letter to, to Paul. And they had some questions. And, and I'm just going to be honest and tell you that there were one of their questions. Was like, well, maybe you shouldn't ever have any kind of sexual relations. You shouldn't even touch a woman. And is that the way we should live? That you know, They were actually thinking it was good to not do anything. Well, that's problematic if you're married, isn't it? If one of you adopts that mindset and the other one's like, whoa, hold the phone. I don't have that same conviction. Now we've got a problem. And so he says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And listen, ladies, do not get ready to beat me down. It goes a little further here. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Does. does that mean you have to do whatever I say whenever I say it? Absolutely not. That's not what it means. In fact, in our premarital counseling, we, we hit one of these sections. It talks about intimacy in marriage, and, and, and we really take time to go through this because if you, you know, I had a couple a number of years ago that said that one of the expectations by the, the one spouse was that there would be interaction every day of the week. And, and, I said, I don't want to build you up for failure. That probably will not happen constantly throughout your marriage. He said, why not? I said, because life happens. And you're going to come home, and with muddy shoes, you're going to walk across the floor that she just mopped. And you're going to throw your clothes in a hallway that she just cleaned, missing the basket she just emptied by doing her laundry. And, and then you're going to complain that supper isn't ready because she did all of those things aforementioned and you know, had just picked up kids. And then you're going to be like, hey, by the way, there's not a chance. Because built into that is a lot of other moving pieces. Relationship. Tenderness. Kindness. Attention. Emotional connection. That's a whole other message. But Solomon, or, Saul, or Paul, too many Saul, Solomon, Pauls here. Paul says in verse 5, stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And, and so what do we see there? Um, marriage is a great thing. That physical relationship between a husband and a wife, it's a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. And even more than that, I could be willing to say that it's necessary. It's God-given and inspired. And as we go into the the context of the marital relationship, we're now to look to selflessly and sacrificially meet the needs and the desires of of our husband or of our wife, as that case may be. And, and it literally says that it will thwart Satan's desire to see godly couples come crashing down. And, and, and I just want to say, this will save us a lot of heartache and headaches down the line when we don't use this part of the marital institution as a weapon against each other. It is not a weapon to be used. It's a gift that's been given to advance your relationship, your intimacy, your oneness. Oneness is a major component in marriage. Now, I do want to say that. There's a, there's, a, there's a strong note of caution here. Strife or frustration in this area never, please hear that, never justifies a spouse looking outside the marital relationship to see these desires met, these cravings satisfied. And I do want to say that a, a lack of, uh, of intimacy in that area is probably an indicator that there may be some other things going on. Maybe Solomon, as he's talking to his son, he's cautioned, like they, maybe this could happen, but there could be some things going on in Rehoboam's life that it would be really easy to look elsewhere to get what God says, no, I've graciously given you through this gift of marriage. And I just want to caution us this morning, never okay by God and his word to step outside the bonds of marriage, the bounds of marriage, to get this intimacy met. And what I want to challenge you, if that's an area of struggle this morning, look to God and his word for his plan, for his purpose. If necessary, and it may be 
seek godly counsel for someone to come alongside and to minister to those areas to restore the brokenness and to gain the ground that's been lost. And so we, we've got God's plan. I blew right past our responsibility, which is to honor God's institution of marriage. Thirdly, it's our resolve this morning. It's our resolve. God has a plan. As his children, we're responsible to follow that. And then thirdly, but it has to become our resolve to do so. And, and yeah, I wrote this notes. This is for myself, Scott speak, but don't step out, step up. Don't step out, step up. We, we have a glorious opportunity. And, and as I shared the last couple of weeks, every couple that comes through this church's office for premarital counseling, their, that groom has to answer this at least 13 times, 14, because on the wedding day, he gets to say it in front of everyone that's present. What is the number one purpose of your marriage? And they would say in concert, if I asked them to this morning, to glorify God. Period. But the fringe benefits are like companionship and relationship and intimacy, fellowship, reproduction, children. Oh, those are wonderful things. But as a child of God, if we will wrap our heads and our hearts around this simple truth... Your marriage is to glorify God first. And that's why we, as a resolve, we do it God's way. As you go back to Proverbs chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, the allure, the temptation may be there to do it our own way. And Solomon says to his son, drink waters out of your own cistern, running waters out of your own well. Let your fountains, and, and, and I want you to hear this. This is not a command to do this. Actually, the King James says it this way. This is really a question. And, and actually, let, let's just go to the, to the New American Standard here. Listen to verse 16 out of the New American Standard because it's not a statement that you should. It's a question of why would you? Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? And then verse 17, let them be only your own and not a stranger's with you. You know, as, as much as, as, as Satan would love for you and I to step outside the lines... You know, I, I want to be honest and say, like, I can't even kill her inside the lines. Somebody asked me to put face paint on them yesterday. I'm like, do you have any idea what you're asking me to do to not puncture your eye hole? I can't kill her inside a line, let alone stay, you know, morally inside the lines that God has me. Satan knows that. And there is a sexually centered world system that he's crafted to lead us astray if we don't guard against it right here, right now. Drink waters out of your own cistern. Running waters out of your own well. Through the course of ministry, statements that I've heard are, but things have cooled off. I think I married the wrong person. It was kind of neat because something I said one time about 12 years ago, I heard on the radio the same week. I don't remember if it was Family Talk or Family Life Today. It was one of those programs, and there was a counselor on there talking with a couple of this live program. And the person said the same thing. I think I married the wrong person. And the counselor said, well, hold on a minute, son. Look at that left hand. Look at that left ring finger. Sir, is that your ring on her finger? He said, yes, sir. Well, then you're married to the right spouse. And, and, you know, something, and I realize there are, there are moving pieces and biblical exceptions in different relationships, and I understand that. But the counselor said something I wrote down, and I've highlighted, and I've used this in every counseling session in this regard. And you have to remind yourself this too, pastor or not. It's not about finding the right spouse. If you're married today, it's by God's grace being the right spouse. Amen. You know, one of the things you read in Ephesians chapter 5, your job as a husband, guys, not easy. Love your wife. Christ loved the church. Yeah, but she burns my food. and She doesn't have things ready when I get home. She stopped doing my laundry. She won't even kiss me when I go out the door to work. So I'm not going to love her. No, that's not what the word of God says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, period. That's your job given to you by God. And you serve and glorify God by doing the job he's given you unconditionally. And ladies like, yeah, but he muddies up my floor. He says my cooking's awful. My mom would never do it that way. He says all the time about everything. 
So I'm not going to respect him. But God's word says, wives, to, to respect, to submit to your husbands as to who? The Lord. And I want to tell you right here, right now, God's work done God's way, it really receives his provision and his blessing. Listen, husbands, right now, I don't care what your wife's doing. You love her as Christ loved the church. Wives, you submit and revere your husbands no matter what he's doing. And the two of you come to the center on that. That marriage is unshakable. It doesn't mean it'll be easy. And it doesn't mean days will get hard. It doesn't mean there might be times she's like, get on your own side of the bed. That may happen. But when it's resting, as each of you are resting on the rock of Christ, that relationship is unshakable. And as you, if you listen to these, these words, these expressions, drink waters, cistern, running waters, well, fountains, rivers of waters, these are some pretty descriptive uh, descriptions as to the value of intimacy within our marriages with our wives or with our husbands. You know, and it, and it, it asks us in one of our sessions, do you find it surprising that God would say that this is a necessary component of your relationship? You're like, no, why would we find it surprising? He ordained it. And when you look at those words, water, streams, well, fountains, you know, we're asked, like, why would he use the illustration of water? Because it's a necessity. It's a necessity. Water's cooling, refreshing. Life-sustaining. So even though it may be difficult in seasons, it's appropriate within our marriages. But only there. And so while the unredeemed flesh will look, and, you know, as young men, as young ladies, we, we've had to resist that. Some of us, we've done a better job or not such a good job as others. And that's been a challenge, and it will constantly be a challenge living in a fallen world to do things in every area God's way. But you continue on in verses 18 and 19. He says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Let her be as the loving hind in the pleasant row. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. And be thou ravished always with her love. You go back to verse 18. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. I love that. He's like, this is your wife. Like, this is the one that you promised before God and others that you would nurture and you would cherish and you would care for in sickness and health, rich or poor, until death do us part. And I, and I appreciate it weekend to remember one of the first things they get you to do is look at your spouse and say to her or him with a smile on your face, and that didn't happen for many couples around us, but you are not my enemy. She's not my enemy. She's the greatest gift that God has given to use to refine me become the man of God that I'm being called out by Christ to be. And she's a precious, precious treasure that God has given me to do the same, to call out the woman of God in her. And one of those things that he's given to help continue fueling the fires is that intimacy that when I focus on the right things becomes more readily available. Gentlemen, your wife is not your enemy today. There is an enemy. And he wants you to see her that way. To pick apart every fault and shortcoming. And then to wield it like some kind of weapon. The real enemy is the one behind that. God's ideal for marriage is one man, one woman for one lifetime till he calls us either one or both of us home or he returns. And so knowing God's plan I want to challenge us this morning. Pour into your marriage. Pour into it. It's a serious business. Like, this isn't like, you know, and I've heard couples say, well, we've been married 50 years, that's good enough. No, I, I, I love the couple that was at Weekend to Remember over 50 times in their 70s saying, listen, I don't want good enough, I want great, and we're not there yet. Pour into your marriage. Pour into your spouse. 
build them up. It's so easy to tear down and to criticize and be critical of every little thing that doesn't go our way. But there is a reason in Proverbs 31, this woman rises up and her husband, he calls her blessed. Her children, they call her blessed. The husband's like, there is no one in this land that compares to you. Do you think there's a reason that wife rises up to do all of those things? Her husband isn't tearing her down. In a similar manner, there's a reason that men can't wait to get back home because what's waiting behind that door is so much superior to anything this world can offer and if we're struggling with building them up the next step you pray for them you pray they'll like god if they could just be the way i want them to be maybe that needs to happen because maybe the way you want them to be is in line with what god would have them to be You see what happens, we start praying for them as my former mentor, Pastor Jim Blair, challenged me early in my ministry here with some bitterness I had towards some folks. It's hard to be bitter towards someone you're genuinely praying God's blessing for. Pray for your your spouse. Encourage them today. Serve them today. What can I do for you? Focus on meeting their needs. And in so doing, we'll honor the great God that we serve. Verse 19, I'd ask one of our teenagers if they would, it was on the screen, I asked if they would read this, and they couldn't read this verse with a straight face, and I said, you will not be reading this Sunday morning then. But we're going to read it together Sunday morning. Letter B is the loving hind in the pleasant row. It speaks of the beauty and the grace of his wife. You know, the temptress, she's alluring. Lips seemingly dripping with honey, smooth as oil, but those ways are the ways of death. He's like, no, son, look at your wife, the wife of your youth. Yeah, you got married, you were young, but you're still there. She's still there. Look at her. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. It talks about the nurturing, soft, and, and tender care that our wives provide. And be thou ravished or intoxicated always with her love. You know, there's a question, a couple questions here this, this morning I want to ask that for husbands and wives, and, and for those that would look to get into a marital relationship down the line, but for our spouses, do they believe that they're a treasure to us? Now, I don't mean, well, yeah, I think they... If you were to ask them this question, do you think that I treat you like you're my greatest treasure next to Christ? What would their answer be? And while they're a gift of God for us to experience, as you see Solomon's like, son, look to your own sister and your own well to satisfy those desires. Do our spouses know that they are so much more important than just that, among other purposes? And I know as we close this morning, you know, this, this is a heavy word. It is. And it's one of the greatest challenges in our culture today. And you know what? Our enemy knows that one of the greatest ways you can hit a church, you can hit a ministry, is to hit our homes. Because this is one of the greatest opportunities that we have to demonstrate the love that Christ has for his bride the church and the intimacy that we can have with, with, with him, between him and us, and the grace, the mercy, the kindness, the forgiveness, and the long suffering that he extends from him to us is, is exactly what he's called us to extend between each other. When an unbelieving world sees something that, frankly, in the natural realm is unbelievable, they have to notice there's something weird about those Christian people. Because they don't do anything in life the way the rest of us do. And that includes marriage. I mean, you, you're, you're going to love them when that doesn't make sense. Or you're going to revere them when that doesn't make sense. And you're not going to test drive the car before you take it off the lot. That doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. It's not natural. It's supernatural. And it's God's plan. And as Solomon reminded his son, and I know, tough words. Proverbs 6.23 says this. Reproofs for discipline are the way 
of life. I know some things that you will hear. They're going to be hard to hear. And some things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. We, we, we have a, a choice to make today. That includes this pastor. You know, this word doesn't, isn't just being wielded as a weapon against the flock. The shepherd is a, is a man in the flesh that has a wife that he's been called to honor as well. And that we have decisions to make. And as Solomon tells his son, reproofs for discipline are the way of life. They hurt, they're hard, they, they call us to respond, but they're the ways of life. And, and maybe this morning's message was a challenge to us today. Actually, I hope it was a challenge to every one of us in this room. For those that are single, for those that are married, for those that, that maybe are getting married. I hope it's a challenge to each of us. And, and, I, and I want you to know, no matter where you are in this process, that God is gracious to come alongside of you. And when we yield these situations to his loving, tender care through the Holy Spirit's power, he will give us the strength to follow his lead. And why do I think no matter how hard your situation may be, that, that he can meet it. Because if you're in Christ today, he already met your greatest need. Because the Son of God, sinless, sovereign, the agent of all creation, sent by a holy and righteous and just Father and Judge, paid a price that we owed, Suffering for the very sins that we wrestle with and maybe we're wrestling with this morning. Not only that we could be forgiven and have a home in glory with him for all of eternity, but so that we, uh, through the life of Christ in us, could be set free from the sin that we're in bondage to, that we struggle with, so that we can honor and glorify him right here, right now. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I believe with all my heart and what the word of God says that if he can meet our greatest need, then whatever our need is this morning, whatever that struggle is, whether you're single, married, or anywhere in between, I'm not sure what that would really be if you're not single, you're not married, what you are in between. But God can meet that need this morning as we yield it to him. And I want to challenge us today to yield those areas to him. Let's close in prayer as the music team comes forward. Father, we, we thank you for your word that it is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. Uh, Lord, I thank you that not only is it the word that made us aware of our sin and, and by trusting in Christ making us aware of our need for him, it's borne us into the kingdom of God, but it is also the word that continues to refine us through the sanctifying work of your Holy Spirit. It's, it's the word of God, as Isaac read last week. How does a young man keep his way pure? And it, it, it's by, by living in every way according to the truth of your word. And it's, it's hiding your word in our hearts that we wouldn't sin against you. And so, Father, thank you, as difficult as these messages are, to know that it's not like, hey, this is what I expect, now go do it. Lord, it's through the power of your word applied by the Spirit as we yield in submission and surrender and complete dependence upon you that you'll do this work within us. And Father, as Solomon reproved his son, I thank you that, Lord, we are your sons and daughters spiritually as we're in Christ, and you reprove us still today. And I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to continue that good work of, of Christ-likeness, the process of becoming more like Christ, that you will continue in our hearts and lives until your return or to our home going, whichever comes first. And Father, I, I thank you for the honor and the glory that your great name uh, that, that's bestowed upon it as we live in, in humble obedience and reverence to you. And, and when we do that, Lord, our spouses, our, our children, our families, our church families, they're the, they're the direct beneficiaries in a sin-stained and sickened world that is in need of that grace, that hope, that mercy. They get to see that example, that pattern in and through our lives. God, continue to change us. We pray that prayer knowing that you will through the power of your spirit and through the life of your son in us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us stand and sing together, Christ, our hope in life and death. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong, who holds our days. apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing Truth. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good. God is good. God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial. Who sends the waves that bring us nigh Unto the shore, the rock of Christ Oh, sing hallelujah Our hope springs eternal Oh, sing hallelujah Now and ever we Christ, our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with Him, where we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy, when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing Christ, our hope in life and death. Thank you, music team. Thank you, Pastor Scott. And uh, just just a quick reminder, even though as a believing church, we agree with this. We believe in marriage. Um, we know that the world doesn't. And, 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 they, and they view and are deceived by Satan. And because of that, we have ministries like our, our local pregnancy resource clinic that we as Heston Chapel get behind. And so as you leave today, we hope that you'll pick up a bottle and support them uh, financially. And uh, that'll be due back um, uh, on Father's Day. And if we can, we'll uh, put, the, put our scripture reading uh, to close on the screen. And we'll read that together. For I am convinced, this is Romans 8, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us 
from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, as we close, Lord, we do, we know that no matter what, as we've come to you, as we believed in you and trusted in Jesus and not in our own selves, uh, but in his death, his burial and resurrection, Lord, that nothing then can separate us. Um, Lord, we do and we, we, we fail you. And, and Lord, we're so thankful that you forgive us for that. And uh, Lord, I pray if anybody here this morning would not know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would confess their sins and repent and believe in Jesus. But Lord, even if maybe some of us this morning realize that we're living in sin, and our relationship with you is not what it needs to be. And there's, and there's a divide. Lord, your word says that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to make that relationship right and ha have us walk close with you again. Lord, I pray that we would do that, that we'd humble ourselves before you this morning. Lord, I pray that you give us safety as we leave here. And Lord, help us to represent you to today this week, and this year. Lord, we love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Heston Chapel, be on mission this week and know that you're loved. You're dismissed.